camera. Okay, well, we're going straight in. So this is, is this episode 18 now? 18? It is episode, our second remote uh, episode. And it's occurred to us that remotely we can get a higher caliber of guest uh, <laughs> because we're, we're asking less of them. And in, in that vein, uh, can we introduce Justin Nichols, the, the, the founder of Fathom, uh, architect and a, a former colleague of us both. So, Justin, welcome. Thank you very much for uh, inviting us along. You've, no, you've noticed, Bill, good. they've got the branding in the background. Well, long, long, <laughs> has it? <laughs> <laughs> um, long, long time no speak. <laughs> yeah. Would you know, I was speaking about you uh, the other day. I met David Illingworth for a uh, oh, drink. Yeah. And this is a chap who's a, an engineer and he used to work at AKT and he recently set up um, London structures lab i think it's, it's right, their business yeah. um and he said oh he'd reached out to a few people who uh when he was going to set up this company and you were one of those and he said he was blown away by the time and the generosity uh you you, you show you got them all in you said oh right setting up a business these are the 20 things i wish i'd known um and i think you've become a bit of a sort of rock star in the kind of startup world and, and, and sharing some of the, the challenges you've, you've found. Yeah, I, th- I think, um, you know, share, sharing is really good because it's, uh, you, you share the knowledge, but I think you share the pain. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and sometimes it's good to kind of verbalise it. It's, it's like, uh, it's like therapy, I'd imagine. Um, yeah. Why don't, why don't you give us like a little like a, a brief a brief catch up for people who don't know about Fathom? Like, because we 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 worked together many years ago back at Make, but how long has it been now since you you started? And how has... so we're slightly used to uh, disasters, and that we set up three weeks before <laughs> the uh, Brexit vote. Um, <laughs> so that that wasn't on the risk list at all, um, but I, I don't think it was on the Treasury's risk list either. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that that was. Uh, Slowed us down a little bit, I think, probably at the start, but um, made us more resilient in, in the longer term um, and made us focus a little bit more on um, what we wanted to do. So, yeah, that's been good. So, we've been going for almost four years. Um, wow. Which is quite exciting. Time flies. That has gone and so has it, quickly. Has it felt, yeah, yeah well, I mean, I bet, it, I bet it hasn't felt like that for, for you guys. But, um, yeah, I, they, disasters come a, a lot, don't they? I mean, Brexit felt like... It felt bad then, didn't it? It felt like the end of the world, yeah. the world for a bit, and then it felt like manageable, and then it just felt like it was lasting so long that it was, it was almost the opportunity cost. We could see what might have been without that. Was that your experience? Yeah, I think so, until you got to uh, where we are now, and, and that feels like a kind of disagreement with a couple of people sitting in a room. For yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, I was thinking then, like, maybe this is like, at great cost, maybe this is the thing we need to heal us all. All those yeah. family members you've bickered with and fallen out with, you know, <laughs> we're all going to get COVID together. Maybe there's a maybe <laughs> sort of unifying benefit to this to this uh, catastrophe. So, yeah. to Justin, how, how many people are Fathom now? Like, how how um, we've grown? We've got a slightly different approach to um, how we structure an architect's practice, and um, Tom Shard who um, is one of the partners and one of the founders, uh, comes from film production. So he was winding down his film production company. And I said, well, why don't you come and help run an architect's practice? And he was like, oh, I don't know anything about architecture at all. And I said, oh, that's perfect. <laughs> um, so we spent probably six months chatting about how to, uh, you know, what we could do differently, what we were good at. And one of the things that really struck me about uh, the advertising world and the film world um, is they bring the right people together to do a project. So a good friend of mine, um, Will Tay, finally got his dream job as being concept artist for Star Wars. Wow, um, nice. And he just sits and draws TIE fighters every day for a living. Which is like <laughs> everyone's dream job, surely. Um, and, you know, you, you bring that team together to do that film, but he probably wouldn't be the best person to do, I don't know, Polgark or a period drama. So applying what Tom had learned in the kind of film and advertising world, we sort of said, well, look, let's put a slightly looser framework together um, for how to run a practice. So we're able to bring in um, sort of experts as and when we need. So Adrian Gaynor, who we work with when we're at Make, um, used, to be at, uh, used to run HOK's laboratory team. 
um, comes in and gives us uh, lab planning expertise um, as and when we need it. So we can plan a lab to a B plus, A minus, he does it to an A plus and beyond. So in a, in a long-winded way of answering your question, we have a sort of core team of about 12 people and then we have probably up to like 25 people um, that we call in to, to do that. Is it, and it's a bit disingenuous, I think, like, and not to sort of criticise that approach, Ben, but like when people say, oh, how, how big are you? It's almost kind of qualified success. But value add is not having a huge team necessarily. And certainly in some of the practices I've worked in, when you're most uh, kind of profitable or, or in fact doing the most exciting work, it is not when you've got the most sort of staff number. So it's about finding that kind of, kind of optimum value add it's more i guess the sense of what what type of place is it you know is it a, is it a sort of yeah, you know, it, bespoke thing or you know it's it's quite boutique i think um and it's what was interesting when we got our first studio space which was two years ago now um we're in waterman's offices uh, stru uh, big structure and environmental engineers um uh, who kindly gave us some space for uh, a little bit longer i think than they thought they were going to give it to us for. <laughs> um, it, you suddenly have a kind of a, a physical identity and we're quite messy people we like stuff on walls and we like making models and all that kind of thing and that, that made a massive difference so in in our sort of current environment um going back to having a studio we, we, we're kind of used to before um but it does really um, cement your culture and your identity I think um, so can, can we just like dive straight into the massive elephant in the room which is we are going to head into a deep dark recession possibly worse than the financial crisis I mean I'm going to paint a rather gloomy, gloomy <laughs> right. picture here you know Justin is a, is a you know a, a superstar and set up this company and then almost immediately found he was facing Brexit and all that uncertainty that that provided. There will be people now setting up businesses or who have, have done so at the start of the year and are now facing this reality. And nobody, nobody knows what to do. I just wondered in the four kind of turbulent years that, well, not that turbulent, sort of successful years that you've had, you know, is there anything you can give people that they might be able to hang on to? Or, I, I think um, sheer determination, or as my wife calls it, stubbornness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, just not, not to give up. And, mm. you know, almost the more the world throws at you, the more resilient you get. Um, and um, one of the things we're really bad at, actually, is not celebrating the good bits. Um, you know, so when you win a job, just, you know, stop take everyone out, have a drink, chill out for a bit, celebrate that fact. Um, and, you know, just have a bit of fun along the way, I think is... That, really is, that is really good. And most difficult for you, because you're thinking, you're sure we've, we've won this job, but guys, that's only going to keep us going for, for a while. I think if you're a bit more junior, it's probably, you know, maybe easier to, to enjoy a, a competition yeah. win or, or something yeah. like that. Um, yeah, I guess... Uh, I guess keep keep at it. There are going to be opportunities here as well. I know some businesses won't survive, and and some 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 will. Um, but actually, maybe it will change our our attitudes to work. You know, maybe our studio spaces will be more will be smaller, and people will come in and out of them slightly, like your business model that you mentioned. I can imagine, you know, workplaces not needing to be quite as as big. Actually, as yeah. people realise that. Uh, they they did actually quite like working remotely half 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 a day a week because mm. they could pick their kids up at a certain time. You know, there were going to be some some major changes, and maybe they, these sort of new typologies of sectors which we've already been exploring in the last few years. I wonder if stuff will come up from this. Well, totally. I think um, it's really good at getting over that kind of corporate and social inertia of change. Yeah. Um, so we, we did our first planning pre-app yesterday on Zoom um, wow. with uh, Southwark and it was fantastic. You know, everybody chipped in. Um, I think it was really good. Um, our clients were quite skeptical. I'm going I'm to say, like, rather cynically, do you, think, um, do you think it helps get positive planning results? Because actually, <laughs> we're all in the blitz together and there's this sense of everyone egging each other on and in a normal environment, 
you know, you might split the panel, but everyone's desperate for this virtual medium to work and for <laughs> life to go on as normal. Do you know what I mean? Or is that, yeah, is that I, not? I think it's, um, uh, I think it's more efficient to a certain extent in that, you know, even if I went to King's Cross for a meeting from our studio at London Bridge by the Shard, that's half an hour each way for an hour's meeting. So I've, I've halved the amount of time I need for that meeting. So, you know, maybe planners could get in twice as many meetings in a, in a month that they yeah. can. Yeah. Oh, I like your, like your thinking there. <laughs> like drive the pressure <laughs> yeah. onto the planners. I'm not, I'm not sure they'll agree with me. Um, but I think there are other things where um, if you've got a very controversial pro a project, I think um, that face-to-face -face meeting and physical models and things like that become really important. So I think there's a lot of nervousness in the planning world at the moment where they have got those difficult projects if they're trying to sit a committee virtually to make sure that you know um, the local community has a chance to kind of comment properly and so forth so I think yes and no probably on, on that and also obviously like those big schemes the impacts of models and visual aids and you know you know that 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 sort of uh, all of those other mediums that, that architects have have to use um, are, you, um, are you are you guys also finding that uh that you other people aren't aware of what other people are doing in the office you have to make a much more conscious decision now uh, so for example our practice the design reviews everyone just logs in and just has it playing in the background even if you're not in a direct involvement yeah. member yeah. just so people get an atmosphere of what's going on and they yeah. you know because you lose that connection don't you if you're not you just can't yeah, see everyone quite nice, isn't it? I, I always remember when we at make i thought it'd be really nice just to have a screen on the background of um the, the office we had in china at the time or hong kong mm. or um and I th yeah i think that's a really nice idea you need that it's kind of communal noise isn't it almost. yeah yeah and um, it's that in, they, they do it in trading floors as well um uh, uh and it's just that the incidental stuff even if you're there like waving like an idiot to your friend in uh, <laughs> in beijing it's kind of like oh you're going home and i'm coming to work and is this, is, it, you know, is, is this another side of bill that we've not seen before <laughs> <laughs> um so can i can i ask i mean like this the, I, I think people you know you, you you've got some expertise now in starting and running a business and i think there's so much uncertainty i think people are worried about their businesses they're worried about uh, losing their jobs and they're worried about what our general economy is going to do when this was coming down the line um for a company like the one i work for which is quite big we're a bit resilient we've, we've actually most people do a bit of work or have got a laptop at home and we've got an IT department of four people who help have build some resilience over the, for, the sort of last few years. Yeah. Then you've got consultants and one man bands and people who are really worried and freelancers who are really worried and actually they live on their wits. And then you're in the, the middle of between those and I wondered if you'd had enough time to build that resilience or how early you made a call on this and saw it coming? Because I certainly was one of those people that just thought, this is overblown actually, and why don't we just kind of get on with it? I mean, uh, I don't know. I think actually, um, I think a couple of things. When we started, um, just on the kind of IT side of things, I said, I don't want to have a server in the studio. I want to be all cloud-based. And everybody's like, oh, we can't do that. It's like, it's unsecure, um, it's risky, we can't manage it as well as we can if it was in the studio. Um, and we made a very quick decision to close the office, I think now two weeks ago, Monday, um, at about 6.15. We were all up and running by 9 a.m. on Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. And we got a stage three and a stage four deadline in on two separate jobs in the same week. So that's, um, yeah. you know, that was, that was mind blowing. It, and you know slightly by accident but by trying to foresee where technology is going in the future um so we use um, dropbox for business we've got uh, and microsoft and they've been pretty much flawless in the four years we started we had a, a ransomware attack uh probably two, uh, two years ago i think really and, um no dropbox got us, how much did you pay <laughs> we pay a penny <laughs> Dropbox got us back up and running in, I think it was a day. It might even have been less than a day. Wow. 
um, which was incredible. And I, you know, and all the amazing IT support we've I've experienced over the years, I've never experienced something that kind of quick. And and do you guys use Revit? So your cloud based like BIM three hundred and sixty yeah. and stuff as well. Yeah, we um, Revit's been glitchy in the studio. Um, but coming out of the studio and working from home, it's still been glitchy, but no more than it has been. Consistently um, annoying. <laughs> and I think we'll flip to 360 if we can bear the brunt of the extortionate price that Adobe seemed to put on it. <laughs> right. Are you still <laughs> using a cracked copy of Photoshop for <laughs> CS6? Yeah, <laughs> I look at our costs, and you know, one of our big, you know, our big cost is salary, and a big cost is rent. Yeah. And technology is creeping up towards rent and yeah. has been getting worse every year. And we've all been a bit cynical about this. And then suddenly here we are at this fork in the road where we don't need rent. Um, technology costs are, are kind of justifiably large, he said, heavily caveated. Yeah. Um, but actually, it's so fundamental to, to, to what, what we're doing. It may be, I think, I think uh, what's difficult for us is we have so many... Um, quite um, large software packages. So if, if we were just running Revit, that would be fine. But when you're going to buy Adobe Suite, which we yeah. don't use as intensively as a graphic designer or an agency would, that's the bit that kind of kills us a little bit. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's some really good freeware out there for things like equivalents of Photoshop, um, which, you know, I use because I use it for very, very small percentages of time. And, and I'm pretty sure most of the studio use very fraction of Photoshop. Um, so did you notice then, if you went from being one or two to four to five to eight to 12, and you're obviously on a, on a kind of um, incredible like future ahead of you, were there these sort of steps where you said, now we need to, now we need to get invest in this. It's, it's not okay to borrow a Photoshop license mm -hmm. or, uh, or, or now we need to, to do, are, are those the sort of the risk, points for people growing. yeah um you know the, the there's a sort of uh, a way things a business we found a business doesn't grow kind of in a linear way it grows in these weird steps and those steps often can... not at all as well <laughs> <laughs> well not at all and this, the steps are really big so when you're on the edge of the step or the inset of the step it's quite scary and somewhere around the middle it's quite nice yeah it's just, it's just about <laughs> three days a year um <laughs> So when, when we were looking for office space, we, um, Tom went out and kind of trawled around London Bridge and I came. I, thought, I found this really nice space. It's got a bit of a terrible entrance, which actually we quite like now. Um, and, uh, but it's a little bit above our means. And so it becomes your like dream office space. Yeah. And then we, were really, we worked really hard. It's like, oh, do we do it? Do we do it? And we did it and we sublet some space um, to some guys who came out of... Um, uh, some structural engineers, graphic structures, and that's been really good for them. Um, I think they quite enjoy. I think they quite enjoy having some architects around, um, and it helps create a bit of studio culture above the people you have. And then obviously that gives us sort of expansion space in the future. Um, the other thing that really annoyed the studio is um, when we sort of our next step up was to throw out the two hundred and fifty pound A three printer and buy a proper one, <laughs> which was really annoying everybody. Um, but instead of doing that, we went and spent five thousand pounds on a three D printer, which is the best investment we've ever made. <laughs> um, we have since got a proper photocopier, but um, yeah, th those little moments were also really nice because you it change it's an up gear in what you can um, either the speed of production um, or your offer to your clients. So we, you know, the three D printer is just constantly going. We can do really fun little models. Um, we can do really important models and they're really good communication devices and um, you know they're pretty much run for free the electricity is peanuts the energy is peanuts and and, and that you don't uh, uh, guess what's key as well you don't now need the local expertise to have the 3d printer guy that's writing the code you know they're not exactly plug and play but like lay people like us can kind of get them get them up and running without too much yeah. Too hard. yeah i think that's i think that's really nice the idea that you uh you, you, you these little moments become massive when when you know you've had to work you know put so much effort in to get a printer that is amazing yeah. and to get that rapid prototype like that first one i think that's really exciting i mean do you, do you still find those moments frequently or now, oh, yeah. now? i'm still i'm still if anyone's listening at that, i'm still trying to find someone who <laughs> can scan the team in various sitting and standing positions so we can print them out <laughs> um, be great. 
Uh, we tried to cloud point scanning. That was a complete nightmare. Um, so yeah, that's that's my mission for the year. And then what what else is going to kind of happen? You know, all this um, arbitrage opportunities that the WeWorks and the office groups have done, where they take these long lets and. Are they going to be hit now? You know, all these, a lot of these co-working offers going to uh, disappear as they don't have people buying licenses to, to use the space in the sort of medium well, they, term. I, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting space to watch, I think. And, you know, it's, it, it, was, it got to quite a crowded space, I think, in the last couple of years. Um, and that expanded out into more flexible um, office space. So not just a kind of single desk in a room. Um, but also, you know, a sort of slightly larger office premises um, and going going forward into um, rented office space where the landlord will come in and fit it out for you. So I think there's some really interesting stuff going on in that space. And I think this will just add to that level of change. I don't think we will all go back to having long leases. When, when we took our lease out, we were, it was, we were toying between a co-working space as a sort of off sort of office with a door on it um, yeah. versus a lease and we went um, for a lease but we negotiated the lease from five years down to three um, with an 18 month break in order to give us the flexibility so landlords are, are moving more towards that I think um, you know if people do spend more time working from home um, then instead of maybe that kind of we work co-working space maybe it's more about clubs and it's more like sociable meeting space um, my experience of those we work type spaces is actually most of the time people are sitting with their headphones on in silence because they're paying to work there. They're not yeah. paying to sit and chat like you would at Soho House. Um, so you know, and it is that it is the thing. I mean, look, we work in, well, I work in W one, and the reason I like going is because I can see all my see all my friends that I work with, and I can go up and have a nice lunch, and I can go to. So hard house afterwards said, uh, you know, it's uh, the location is fun because of its social aspect. It's the, yeah. the work. I think we can pro we are getting better at doing remotely. And actually, if you're a sort of extrovert that's easily distracted like me, it's been quite productive to do to, <laughs> to be kept in a room without anybody to play with all, all day. But um, it, it, we are going to need that. I just wonder what you guys are doing at Fathom. Are you? Are you, do you have your big huddle at the start of the day or does everyone find that a bit overbearing or do you just yeah. sort of call, call through the day or what's, what are you thinking? I think we, um, we've been doing sort of Friday afternoon beers, which is good. Yeah. Um, our second one last week. We need to get better at that. I was talking to someone at the weekend. Uh, they'd be doing bingo. Um, Friday <laughs> <Okay. and Vegas. laughs> so, so you've got something to chat with. I think that those little chats at the beginning of conference calls are still quite nice. Yeah, um, I had a, I had my I, we had an e dinner party on, uh, on Friday <laughs> night. I we set up the candles, we dialed in Rosie and Paddy. Uh, I'd like to say it was fun, but after they left, it's like, yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were like, so there's a sense of kind of like uh, they they go on slightly longer than they should do. Some of these yeah, like yeah. social things has been my interest, but, but I haven't. You know, I'm, I'm making phone calls. I haven't made a phone call since like the late '90s. And now I'm like <laughs> ringing up old mates, saying, uh, "You know, I'm, I'm sort of indulging, <laughs> indulging that again." It's like a podcast. It's just interactive. And the other I was talking to somebody earlier, and they said that these sort of cheek muscles back at the back of your jaw <laughs> yeah. start really aching because you you put put on this kind of not quite fake smile, but a slightly bigger yeah. smile than you would if you're down the pub. Yeah, literally. <laughs> just I, 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 I want. I want to ask you a question. You said you had uh, was it graphic structures in your office? Are they are they are they, are they still there or? No, yeah, they're working from home as well. So they're oh, okay. Um, but yeah. they're they're still they were well, uh, up until two weeks ago. They were still members of your yeah, yeah. studio. Yeah, 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 that's quite. I think that's really cool. That's like that's that's the dream, isn't it? To have that kind of um, those kind of mixed, uh, you know, mixed people. You know, just to just to change up the atmosphere in the office a bit. I mean, have you yeah. found it's been quite? You said it's been a good working relationship. Yeah, it's, it's nice, and you can. Um, um, it's quite nice having a few someone else running a business from from my perspective, because you you can sh you can set, share the same pain. Mm. And I think that's right. And you get you've got some you kind of you've got a confidant who's not um, a member of well a partner or a member of staff or whatever how you ever refer to them who who you know has has skin in the game. I think that sort of community. And we all um, we've got a little table tennis net. We chuck over the meeting table. 
Um, it's like a kind of... Um, it's like Silicon Valley, Justin. You're, you're explaining the dream no, it, What's weird is it, it's, it's a little bit narrower than a normal table tennis table. <laughs> um, Excuses. And it's, and it's got a like, desktop linoleum on top. So it's quite a different type of table tennis. <laughs> um, so when it's home to... turf advantage, surely. That's a... <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's table home turf advantage until we all went out and played table tennis one night and we realised actually a bigger table tennis table <laughs> is really hard to play on. Um, that's really, really good at getting everybody, um, you know, that there's normally a game going on at lunchtime, normally a game towards the end of the day, and that helps everybody just get out of their desk. So, so, how, so what advice would you have for, for people out there who are facing this, this kind of uncertainty? We've, talked, we've spoken about some of the opportunities and the changing, uh, the changing kind of realities of the sectors and obviously the benefits of like tenacity. I'm interested you spoke about the community of, I mean, whether they're entrepreneurs or just business leaders, you know, there are obviously people within your office, there's, a, you know, you're, you've been very approachable to people and I'm sure people mentored you as you were getting off, off the ground. Is that, is that the secret to find people who are a few years down the line that can give you, give you the right steps? Yeah, I think, I think mentors are really, really important and I um, had a good friend in just before Christmas um, who ran a big um, uh, M&E practice and um, I was like, oh, David, I'm at wit's end. You know, we've 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 done Brexit. It's a David, day. is it? Rather than yeah. being an any um, <laughs> and, uh, David Long from Long and Partners. Um, <laughs> and uh, I sort of showed him everything we were doing. And so Justin's is exactly where we've been. I said, all, all the numbers look exactly the same. All the all the tediousness is exactly the same. All the painful stuff is exactly the same. Um, and that was really reassuring because it's kind of like actually we're in theory we're doing everything right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. If I ask somebody else, that would be completely different. Um, and I think also mm -hmm. having, having younger mentors as well as older mentors is really important. Um, so, you know, what, what do, um, you know, that younger generation of people that maybe I'm not in contact with so much, or you guys aren't in contact with so much, mm -hmm. because that's mm -hmm. where those fresh new ideas are. Um, so yeah, yeah. that's, that's yeah. Really, really important. <laughs> no, it is. And, and actually they, uh, they represent the talent which you are trying to attract. Uh, yeah. So you know what they what drives them. Absolutely. We, um, when we were doing the bioescalator um, at Oxford, at Oxford for the University, um, when we were at Make, we had a conversation about the cafe space at the ground floor, and um, the, the professor of medicine was kind of, oh, I'm not really sure about this. You know, when, when we bring investors here to talk to the scientists, you know, is it a good idea that there's loads of undergraduates running around, and um, uh, the week before we'd been to Imperial and they put their incubator space right in the middle of the undergrad campus at South Kent. And I was just like, well, why, why did they do that? And it's like, well, that's because where all the young people are and they've got all the fresh new ideas. So if you mix the experience with that youthfulness um, and fresh thinking, and um, that's, that's where that sparks. Um, so the conversation we had in the end um, was a question of language. So you and I would call it a cafe. And I said, well, um, what if we look at it as junior common room and senior common room? And as soon as you said that, they were like, yeah, get it now, understand. Yeah. Take a funder to the senior common room. Um, and the undergrads can stay in the junior common room. Um, so is that a space that, you, that Fathom are, are, are focusing on, the, the kind of science and education and laboratory education? Yeah, it's, it's an expertise we developed over the years. Um, really proud that the Jenner Institute at Oxford. Um, Fantastic. Uh, first lab that I was involved in designing um, is leading on the uh, coronavirus vaccine. So they're, they're wow. advertising for uh, uh, people for human trials this week, which is great. Um, and they also led the Ebola trials um, uh, a few years ago. So, you know, it's great wow. to see world leading sort of science coming out of that. And as, as an architect, um, you're a little tiny, tiny cog in their desire to move science forward. And I think that's a really, uh, amazing thing to be part of um, and you know for, from an architect's perspective I think you've got to remember what your role is your role is not to get an RBA award your role is actually just to help them do whatever it is that they need to be doing a, a lot of a lot of um, like uh, b businesses spend time trying to connect their staff with what the ultimate benefits of the product uh, that yeah. we've all been working towards is um, I don't actually think we're always the best as, a, as an industry at dealing with that, you know, going and showing some of the designers who have delivered it. 
look, you're, you're part of this team, or all right, kind of slightly removed. Because part often we hand over the keys and it's, it, and we're not, you know, we're not really invited back. Um, and that's a really good example of reminding people of what a core message and drivers are. Um, and it's yeah. incredibly motivating, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the same with homes and designing, you know, spaces that people live in. It's, and it's, it's quite often it's very hard to get back into those places. Um, and, you know, people move on, organisations move on. Yeah, normally do shots of residential architecture have like ladders and tiny bits of tape. It's like just when the snagging's being done, where they're still allowed to like take photographs. Yeah. Um, um, but we, we found a really good piece of research. Um, we were doing some um, build to rent um, housing design for legal in general. And um, we were looking at high density living, and I stumbled across this report. And so I was like, well, what's this? It's, um, Oh, so the London School of Economics has done a, a post-occupancy review of high-density living in London. And it was really, it was sort of tucked away as a PDF on, on, the, on, a, on Google somewhere. And I downloaded it, read it, and it was an amazing piece of work. It was really, it, it had so much depth of thinking and knowledge and statistics. And we used that then to help us design better flat layouts. And there were some really easy things to improve on, like... Um, storage you know everybody knows res- storage and residential accommodation there's, you know, there's not enough of it um, but when you read into it it was kind of the biggest frustration was oh the architects designed the glass right up against the party wall so I can't put my wardrobe in the corner of my bedroom and it's like oh my god that's so that that's free that's that's cost free cost neutral area neutral free so that's not even a, a for discussion with the developer and even things like, you know, we, we had tall buildings. So if you're in a tall building and living room, ideally you want to be looking down as well as out. Um, so we said, if we put a 400 millimeter sill in, that's just enough to put a low table and a television on top and not look out of place. So that, you know, that's a proper piece of post occupancy review. And I think it, even if we can't get back into the homes we've designed, um, it's actually just, drawing on that really good research yeah and, and, and it's so easy to con- well it's much easier to convince people uh, or developers or clients when you've got that data as well um, yeah so, okay, I've got, got a question for you so and I noticed you're a bit of a fan of um, Pret sandwich shops yes I am <laughs> and, um, and uh, so jo- Jonathan Mitchell who you guys remember from make um, who's at Fallon has, has got a Pret um, architecture project which is mapping the opening times of prep across the city because they, they, they reflect on where the, when the footfall is. And I, th- I think it'd be a really good project for you to get involved in. <laughs> uh, you're on lock- That's great. So, so they're using that to govern like people movements as a sort yeah. of reverse engineer. Yeah. Wow. Post, post, post COVID, it's uh, not looking too racy for them, is it? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, you, know, you could probably maybe. tell Jonathan a lot of that data. Can you, or, uh, yeah, you're my local love of Pret, yeah. <laughs> I think um, to do that as a little lockdown project of just going to yeah. Google Maps and remember each one. <laughs> Are you a, you know, like it's obviously it's such a, like a hot topic now and everyone wants to ask like, oh, what is, what is architecture going to look like in a, in a post, you know, COVID world? It, yeah. Do you, I mean, have you guys thought about that? I mean, is it just like, well, we'll all go back and it'll just be the same and we'll all love outdoor spaces a bit more? Or do you think there will be a, a sort of shift at all? Um, I think there's some really um, interesting, subtle changes. And I think you know, there's always a sort of bounce against a sort of knee-jerk reaction. Um, and we we're talking earlier about, you know, things like public spaces. And it's like, well, are, are there sort of subtle things that one could do about in public spaces like parks that if you had another pandemic would make that park much safer to go and exercise in um, not like I saw on Google today as somebody uh, it was an Ikea bench without the bit sitting in the middle and just a bit on the sides um, <laughs> but you know it really really stupid things I've noticed like opening a park gate there's, there's a little park gate we go into it's like that's the one point we have to touch something when we leave the house and those yeah. kind of things are quite easy to mitigate I think I think there's a there's a great article in the, in the uh, Guardian a couple of days ago called uh, a letter from Italy that I'm sure is still available saying yeah we're all in this together but class still plays a huge role and and surviving in a lovely Victorian townhouse with a little bit of outdoor space is a lot different to being in a, a, a house share with six adults uh, 
you know, for, for this period. I think there is going to come a, a, a big discussion about what's, uh, what's an acceptable amount of space to, to live in um, and plan for stuff like this in the same way that, you know, we're designing roofs and balconies for serious rainfall, not the 50 year storms, but yeah. the 50 year storms every 18 months and the drainage channels are big. And uh, in the same way that, that that's kind of real now, maybe it's not crazy there'll be another pandemic in the next 10 years. You know? Yeah, we, we had quite an interesting discussion in the office today um, uh, about this kind of thing. And um, one of the conclusions we came to about homes is actually we need to build stronger communities because if we've got stronger communities, we don't we a won't feel so isolated because we know the people next door, upstairs, downstairs, um, and you've got you've got that connection even if you can't see them, coupled by better design of homes so that you know there are more balconies, um, you can actually view the streets properly or the, the kind of communal mm-hmm. space, and um, and I think actually that folds into things like. Um, you know, sort of built to rent properties where you get a huge amount of communal space. Um, and, and, and I was thinking, well, maybe that'll go away. And I said, no, actually, that's even more important because you, that's there to build the sense of community and the community can live on when you're in lockdown and then come out again. Whereas if you don't have a sense, if you don't have a community, you, I think you'd feel much more isolated. So I think it's, it's potentially more psychological than it is. It's interesting. I mean, yeah. we, we, like thinking about those PRS and, and, and some of those new typologies we've been working on about um, having actually smaller bedrooms, but a, a larger kitchen. So you've got a kind of hot plate in your room and a more commercial. Actually, in an environment like this, you're thinking about some of the crazy narratives which are going to come to light when this is all over. <laughs> of people that have been living with a one night stand for three months because they couldn't like, self isolate anywhere else. Or, I, you know, there might be people in these, um, oh, the name escapes, these kind of co living things where actually you're in your room and you're not going out to the, the, the kind of communal areas. And yeah, what we- the impact of that is. We were uh, we were looking at some articles as well. That there's some like these wonderful images in Italy of people sat on their roofs, you know, just waving at each other. And you just you see so much unused space, and you just you can't help thinking that people will will just put more weight on this idea that um, okay, let's see you're in a communal block of flats with 50 flats, but you've got a green space on the roof or across the car park. Uh, you know, they use this unused green space on the roof, and people genuinely that adds value to that that kind of flat because they've they've got like a kind of a private but communal green area i yeah. think i think people are going to really put some value on that after this and, and also there's a weird thing where actually kind of high density living you you're you're likely to see more people out of your window or balcony yeah than you are in a terrace where we are you know you know notwithstanding the issue of you know we've got a little tiny garden that my um five-year-old can uh, five-year-old sorry <laughs> nine-year-old can do keep you up he's in with his football <laughs> but not really big enough to properly play football but you know that's a luxury compared with those that have got like Juliet balconies and things yeah i mean so, it's, yeah, it's, it's been blowing our mind that uh some of our colleagues that i work with they're in like a flat show with three or four people <laughs> <laughs> they don't even have a balcony yeah. and they're self-isolating and have been for like a week and a half and it's like wow <laughs> I bet they're very pleased that the government have added off licenses to the essential food list. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you know, we were thinking about all, all of this. Like, I've got two very small children. Although it's incredibly intense, uh, and I've been fantasizing about what self isolating without children <laughs> would be like. Like the dream, the absolute dream. But then I'm thinking of it from another perspective. I'm not sacrificing anything. I gave up my social life about four years ago. It's other than not going to the office and doing my work here. It's quite similar to, to how life has been. I think if you're single and you're dating, and you're into theatre and film, and like they, there's a huge compromises. Um, many people yeah. that are making that 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 I'm I'm not. I think I think as architects, we're really lucky that um, you know there's quite a lot of streams of work we can be doing. Mm. Um, in lockdown so you know the, the planning department's been really good at keeping pre-apps and conversations going so all that pre-planning work we're finding is carrying on um, and sort of the production information detailed design phase is you know it's not as easy as being in an office but it's it's not far off obviously and actually we're finding in that like a slightly larger pool of people it's actually 
people are more willing to share team members from other from other places than they would normally be because yeah. it's like oh it's a re an unused resource for a few yeah. days would you mind helping on this it's like yeah sure sure so there, there are some benefits there mm -hmm. i mean um do you think one of the challenges we will all find is the lag when we'd be winning work around this time and it may be developing into proper projects in, in a few months time you know the, the whole of the networking and the meeting people and creating opportunities that you know is that is that actually going to come and hit us at the end of the year um i i think in terms of marketing i've found it equally good if not slightly better now than before because people are stuck at home they quite like having a chat um so you know like you said there's more more phone calls happening um it's probably a little bit harder with people that you've never met but certainly all the people that you do know um, that that's become um, much easier to sort of get, get in touch with. I think I think the concern is the economic impact and you know the debt that goes with that economic impact slowing us down. Um, I think that's the that's the biggest issue. And actually, there's no unlike Brexit or um, previous financial crisis. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with the world once coronavirus goes away. Um, you know, there's no, we don't have to wait two years for a Brexit negotiation, it will be gone. Um, and I think that will bring a lot of positivity back and, you know, we will have one hell of a party. <laughs> <laughs> I just think yeah. the day those yeah. pubs and clubs open, just... Oh, think of the is it going to be like V Day think, think or the, something, you know? Like no, think, the, think of the impact on the NHS when all those people go out and <laughs> Well, do you know what? We, we have to like wrap this up and I was hoping to, to end on a, a positive note. So I'm, I'm going to hold on to a, a <laughs> Christmas party of the, the, the end of days. Yeah. Um, so Justin, it's been really nice to, to hear you and talking so openly and honestly. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, Justin, we, we, we've, been, we've been ending on a bit of a kind of predictive high and we're, we're kind of, because this is so real, who knows what it will be in a week's time, let alone in a month's time. As part of our crystal ball gazing, how long do you reckon we'll be on lockdown for? <laughs> and then Ooh, we can. Great, yeah. great. We'll hold I, I, I thought you were going to ask me what's my uh, crystal ball gazing. What do you think a positive future looks like? And I was going to say that I think Prince Philip is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> classic, classic. It's just, just a hunch. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, oh, watch this space. What do, what do you reckon, lockdown-wise? Um, well, I, I was gonna, I was gonna go for three months. What's that? What's that? It's twelve weeks. Twelve weeks. Wait, yes. That? yeah that? Okay. Very much going with the government's line here on twelve weeks and Prince Philip. So uh, I <laughs> wouldn't believe everything he said. Just a lot of fun. Thank <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. Take it easy.